afternoon, and welcome to this edition of HDSA and Me. Last month, Dr. Martha Nance gave us a refresher on the typical symptoms of Huntington's disease, as well as the care needs of persons with HD as the disease progresses. Today, in HD 303, we'll examine our hopes and goals for the future and how the HD medical research and advocacy communities can work together to achieve better lives for people with HD and their families. As a reminder, you can send a question at any time during the presentation. Just click on the chat function in the toolbar, type your question and press send. Your questions will be answered at the end of the session. And now a bit about our speaker. Martha Nance is a neurologist and geneticist who has served as medical director of the HDSA Center of Excellence at Hennepin Healthcare in Minneapolis, Minnesota since 1991. He's an active clinician and has also participated in many HD clinical trials, as well as serving on the executive committee of the Huntington Study Group twice. She co-authored A Physician's Guide to the Management of Huntington's Disease, third edition, and wrote the Juvenile HD Handbook, both published by HDSA. She's particularly interested in genetic testing, juvenile HD, and care of late stage HD. We're delighted to welcome Dr. Nance here today and turn the broadcast over to her. Well, thanks so much, Deb. It's, a, it's really been a pleasure to do this series of talks and uh, hopefully everybody also attended the convention uh, over the weekend and feels fully up to date. Um, I'm gonna talk about um, several different topics today that don't quite flow together. So um, there'll be a topic and then I'll stop and kind of go on to the next one. And this is really beyond what I think of as being beyond the basics. Um, the, the disclaimer, um, you know, if I say anything that implies that there's a treatment that everybody should rush out and get, understand that uh, you need to speak to your own physician about any treatment or exercise or supplement that, that, um, that any speaker at a talk like this may, may um, discuss. And my own disclosures um, are, are up here. Um, sometimes I, there, there really isn't gonna be any discussion of off-label use of medications in, in this um, presentation. So what are we gonna talk about? So I, I, one thing I think it's helpful for people with Huntington's and families to understand is, is how um, doctors and researchers even think about the brain or, or approach it or try to study it or understand it um, and understand that there's sort of different ways to look at the brain. Um, I, I will sort of have a little session about how did we end up with the medications that we currently use to, to treat uh, Huntington's disease or symptoms of Huntington's disease. I'll spend some time on um, the, I think, what we all think of as the, the great hope for the future, which is treating the actual genetic abnormality that causes Huntington's disease. Can't talk about that without also talking about learning from our failures. I think everybody by now knows of the, the two recent trials um, that were looking at treatments directed at the gene that, that didn't pan out so well. And then finally, I'll um, preach for a couple of minutes at the end about uh, kind of a call to action. So first, how to study the brain. And I, you know, if you think about how does somebody, how do different people think about a car? How do you think about the brain? Well, there's kind of the overall design, the shape and the, the parts and the colors and the, and so on. What's in the, uh, you know, if you look at the Indy cars, I was watching the Indy 500 a few weeks ago and boy, how the Indy cars overall design has changed over the years. But you can also think about the fuel system. In the case of the brain, that's the, the arteries that go up to the brain. Um, and if you're a stroke specialist, that's kind of what you spend most of your time thinking about is how can you unplug a, a stuck fuel line? Um, what it, the brain is just a bundle of nerves. It's, in a, it's a great big, huge electrical system. So, so isn't that an important way to think about the brain? And that's certainly when people are dealing with epileptic seizures. That, that's something that has to do with abnormal electrical discharges in the brain. There's the hydraulics, the support systems. There's individual components. Some people might specialize in tires or hubcaps or uh, front end alignment or brake repair. Um, and similarly, just looking at that picture of the brain, you can see that there's, there's different parts of the brain. There's kind of the brain stem, the sort of stick-like thing at the bottom. There's the cerebellum, the kind of uh, the, the little semicircle on the, on the lower right. And then there's the sort of thinking part of the brain. Um, in the case of Huntington's disease, we're, we actually think more about uh, the effects of time or injury. How does the brain heal from some kind of a, a damaging force? 
Um, and in particular in Huntington's disease and other neurodegenerative diseases, there seems to be trouble, the, the brain cells have trouble discarding waste products. In the case of Huntington's disease, the abnormal Huntington protein seems to kind of accumulate inside the cell and, and that accumulation of trash, if you want to call it that, uh, seems to, to kind of clog up the cell and make it sick. And then maybe there are other unique features about a particular car or a particular person's brain or a particular disease uh, uh, set up that, that you might uh, uniquely want to study. And that, that's just by way of helping you understand that, that um, uh, you may read um, or learn about different studies that just sound like there are one is from Mars and one is from Jupiter. Somebody's talking about electrical troubles in the brain. Somebody else is talking about chemicals in the brain, somebody else is talking about blood supply of the brain, somebody else is talking about imaging of particular structures in the brain. Um, sometimes we as uh, scientists, researchers, doctors have trouble sort of synthesizing all that or putting it together. But I actually think it's kind of neat that, that um, there are so many different ways to view the brain and, and then insight might come from so somebody looking in, uh, in any of these um, uh, different ways. So how do we get to the drugs that we actually currently are using uh, and why do we not use other drugs? Um, well, one set of symptoms for which we have treatments in Huntington's disease is the chorea, the involuntary kind of dance-like movements. And kind of how we got to treatments for that is, is by um, looking at the more common disease, Parkinson's disease. People with Parkinson's disease don't move very well. Uh, they're kind of stiff and slow. And then they take their, their Parkinson medicine, which is um, the primary Parkinson medicine is basically eating a, a pill that, that looks like or acts like or uh, uh, turns into dopamine. Dopamine seems to be the chemical that's missing in Parkinson's disease. And you know what happens if a patient with Parkinson's takes too much of their dopamine? They develop chorea. Um, we call it something else. We call it dyskinesia in the Parkinson's clinic, but basically they develop dance-like involuntary movements. So that you kind of get the idea that not enough dopamine makes a person be not able to move and too much dopamine causes you to move too much. So if you want somebody to not move too much, might you give them a drug that, that either blocks dopamine in the brain or depletes dopamine from the brain. And that's exactly what the drugs are that we now use. Um, the two drugs that are specifically approved uh, by the FDA for treating chorea are tetrabenazine and deuterated tetrabenazine or Osteto. Um, those are both drugs that deplete dopamine. There's an ongoing trial right now called Connect HD that's looking at a third drug in that category called valbenazine to see whether it will have equal effects or better or less effects than the two that are already available. Um, in the past, before we had drugs like tetrabenazine, I guess I am talking about off-label use of drugs. Um, doctors would sometimes reach for drugs that are dopamine blocking drugs, of which there are quite a number. They fit into the category of drugs that we that are typically used in the psychiatry clinic as antipsychotic drugs, or sometimes we call them neuroleptic drugs. But you could imagine that a drug that blocks dopamine might also block the extra movements that Korea. And some doctors will use um, a, um, you know, other drugs, um, benzodiazepines, amantadine, uh, again, sort of by analogy of, of how you might treat that extra movements in somebody with Parkinson's disease. Um, a treatment that's commonly used in Parkinson's is deep brain stimulation, where you put an electrode in a particular part of the brain and you turn it on, and that actually turns off the cells that cause tremors or the cells that cause um, the, the dyskinesia or chorea. Um, there have been studies uh, a long time ago, and actually I, there are some, some studies coming up once again about doing deep brain stimulation as a treatment for chorea in Huntington's disease. The reason it hasn't really taken hold is because the chorea often all by itself is not the biggest issue for many people with Huntington's disease. The, the, at the same time that there's chorea, there's also the cognitive changes and the behavioral changes and fixing just the chorea for a lot of people isn't really gonna uh, change their uh, quality of life or change what they're able to do. But it's something that sort of floats out there and, and periodically you will hear of a research study 
uh, uh, looking at deep brain stimulation. What about treating the memory, the thinking or memory problems, the cognitive troubles in Huntington's disease? And there we have a problem that it's not very similar to Alzheimer's. So Alzheimer's disease is the more famous uh, and more common disease that causes dementia. Huntington's disease also causes dementia, but it's completely different in terms of what parts of the brain are affected, which chemicals are involved, um, which brain chemicals are involved. And so we really don't expect that drugs that are useful in Alzheimer's disease are actually going to help cognition in Huntington's disease. So this is an area where there's more work needed and, um, and there are starting to be uh, trials coming up of novel drugs um, to look specifically at cognition in Huntington's. So stay tuned for that. Um, where we spend most of our time with medications in the Huntington's clinic is, is treating the psychological or behavioral symptoms, um, um, symptoms like depression, anxiety, irritability, impulsiveness. Um, and again, in, how, how do we figure out what drugs to use to treat those symptoms? Well, those symptoms are not unique to Huntington's disease. People with head injury will also often have impulsiveness or irritability and Probably half the population of, of, uh, of Minnesota in the winter is depressed because um, it's so dark and cold. Um, and everybody over the last year with COVID and so on was anxious. So, so these symptoms are very common in people who don't have Huntington's disease. Sleep disturbance is another one that's, that's not unique to Huntington's disease. And, um, and so commonly we use drugs that treat these symptoms in people who don't have Huntington's disease thinking, well, they may just, may, they may as well help um, people who have those symptoms who do have Huntington's disease. So in general, the chemicals that we're trying to affect in treating depression are chemicals like serotonin and norepinephrine and to a lesser extent dopamine in the brain. Um, uh, so we wanna boost uh, things like serotonin, norepinephrine, dopamine to treat depression. On the other hand, you actually sometimes want to reduce dopamine or block dopamine or sort of overexcitability of the nerve cells as a treatment for irritability or impulsiveness. Um, often we use um, drugs that were first marketed as seizure medicines um, uh, to treat uh, impulsiveness or explosive behaviors uh, with the idea that you know, what causes a seizure is an abnormal electrical discharge what causes impulsiveness or, or explosiveness? Well, it must be the brain is sort of firing off. The nerve cells are overexcitable. Um, and then, you know, there's nothing wrong with treating anxiety and sleep disturbance with things that aren't medications, as we also do for people who don't have Huntington's disease. So if there's issues underlying the anxiety, if there's, um, uh, you know, other causes for sleep disturbance, um, ought to be evaluated and treated appropriately. So that's kind of how we get to the, the drugs that we're using today. But obviously, um, none of these medications that we use today in the Huntington's Clinic change the course of the disease. So how are we going to change the course of the disease? Um, I've shown this slide in all three of the presentations. But in this presentation, I really want to emphasize the part where it's a genetic disease. That's the unique feature of Huntington's that, that really gives us a hook, something we can kind of sink our teeth into um, to, to try and address. Everybody with Huntington's disease has the same root cause, which is this CAG repeat expansion within the Huntington gene. And I can't say that about people with Alzheimer's disease or Parkinson's disease. We don't always know what the root cause um, for those conditions is, but we do in the case of Huntington's disease. So let's go after that genetic cause of Huntington's. So there are a number of um, approaches to doing that. Um, and I'll show a slide in a minute that may help to um, sort of show this in, in a more pictorial way. Um, I think um, uh, I, I had several experiences over my lifetime where I was trying to explain Huntington's disease to an eight-year-old. And once they hear that it's caused by an abnormal gene, any eight-year-old in the world is going to say, can't you just cut out that abnormal gene? And we used to, I used to just pat the kids on the head and say, well, that's a great idea, but we don't have any scissors that are small enough to cut out a gene. And how are we going to cut it out of every cell in the brain? 
Well, that's what CRISPR is. CRISPR is basically little tiny scissors. Um, and then the challenge is how do you get that CRISPR little tiny scissor into all the cells in the brain? And how can you make sure that those little tiny scissors only cut out the abnormal Huntington gene without somehow cutting out some other gene? And at this, at this point, CRISPR is, is still a, um, uh, it's a tool being used in the research labs. It is not quite ready for prime time in terms of clinical trials in Huntington's disease, but it's an exciting idea that maybe we do have little tiny scissors um, that the eight-year-old I talked to 30 years ago was right. Um, but in the meantime, the, the treatments that have hit uh, clinical trials are treatments to, uh, quote, turn off the abnormal gene. Um, and there are different kinds of these treatments that have these different acronyms that stand for long words that nobody can pronounce. So there's antisense oligonucleotides, or ASOs. There's RNA interference, or RNAi. And there's zinc finger nucleases, or ZFN. These are all things that you can... Um, uh, put into the cell that we think will help to turn off the abnormal gene. And as I said, I'll show a picture of that um, uh, in a, a couple of slides. Um, so I've listed one, two, three, four, five, six, at least seven different companies that are looking at different versions of turning off the abnormal gene. Um, if when you have a gene that sits inside the nucleus of the cell and you want to use that gene to make a protein, you can't take the gene out of the nucleus and you can't, and you can only make the protein in the ribosome. So somehow you got to get the information from the nucleus to the ribosome so you can actually use that recipe. The, and the way the cell does that is to make a Xerox copy of the gene, which is called RNA. And so, so three different companies are looking at strategies um, to not, not cut out the gene itself or change the gene but to alter that RNA copy of the gene that's used when the, um, when the cell wants to use that recipe to make the Huntington protein. So Novartis, PTC Therapeutics, Oclanavile, these are all companies that are looking at strategies to, to modify the RNA copy. And one of the latest things that's come up, and I suspect there are sessions about this during the um, convention, um, um, we think that, um, uh, one of the things that happens in the brain cells that we didn't really realize until recently is whatever the CAG repeat number is in your blood cells. Let's say you have, you got a gene test when you were 20 and it turns out one of your genes has 17 repeats and that's normal. And the other gene has 44 repeats, that's not normal. And that will eventually lead that person to develop Huntington's disease. But it seems that that 44 repeat gene inside the brain cells, at some point, the repeat number can start to increase. And that further increase in the CAG repeat number within the nerve cells seems to correlate uh, with when the symptoms start to, start to uh, become more obvious. Um, that increase in the um, repeat number is mediated by um, some important enzymes in the, in the cells uh, called DNA repair enzymes. And actually, the, the um, better the DNA repair enzymes are functioning, the worse uh, it, the effect is on the CAG repeat. Um, so the question is, can you actually block um, certain DNA repair genes as a way to slow down the further increase in CAG repeat that seems to lend itself to causing HD symptoms. The problem with that is DNA repair genes is what keeps you from getting cancer. So you're gonna have to be, we're gonna have to be very careful about how we use um, these kinds of treatments. Maybe you can, if you have a slight effect on one DNA repair gene, but not another, um, that'll work. This is a whole area of study that's, that's just starting, um, but is moving rapidly. So here are four completely different ways to try to um, have an impact on Huntington's really right at that, at that gene or the, the, um, what the, the gene recipe level in the cell. Um, let me show a slide that describes the, um, the uh, the approach where I said turn off the abnormal gene, which is kind of the approach that Roche, Wave, Unicure, uh, 
and uh, Voyager, several other companies are looking at. So if you have a cell, there's the nucleus, there's the ribosome. And if you don't like those words, think of the cell as being your house and the nucleus is the library and the ribosome is the kitchen. And there are two um, Huntington genes. The red one is the normal one. The blue one is the abnormal Huntington gene that's too big. It has too many CAG repeats in it. And when the cell wants to use that gene to make the Huntington protein, it makes a Xerox copy of that gene. And the Xerox copy, that RNA, swims, flows, floats over to the ribosome where it is then used to make the Huntington protein. That's what you want to happen. Look at that, the normal RNA went to the ribosome and made a normal Huntington protein. But if that blue RNA makes its way to the ribosome, it'll make that Huntington protein that's too long and that kind of falls apart and gums up the cell. So, so what these companies are doing is to put into the cell um, these little black things, um, which are either ASOs or microRNAs, depending on which company with which kind of treatment. And those, um, uh, kind of like a hand and glove, they fit exactly to the abnormal uh, Huntington uh, RNA and keep it from getting to the ribosome. So it's kind of, you, you hope it's gonna be sort of like a hand and glove that the, the ASO will stick to just the abnormal um, uh, Huntington mRNA and hopefully it won't stick to, you know, if your hand is too small, it just doesn't fit inside that great big glove very well, the glove falls off. Um, so what we wish we could do with this gene silencing is to just turn off the abnormal gene uh, without turning off the normal gene. The other challenge, of course, is how do you deliver this to the cells of interest? And that's where some of these companies are, are different. So the both Roche and Wave delivered the, um, uh, their drug to the cell by means of uh, frequent spinal infusions. So the patient would have to have a spinal tap every so often. Um, Unicure is another company that's um, gonna deliver this by, or is currently in a trial delivering this by a surgical infusion directly into the brain, um, but then you're done. Um, so there's different ways to uh, try and get these uh, drugs into the cell. Um, the Roche product um, actually turned off uh, both the both copies of the gene, so it would it would stick to both the red RNA and the blue RNA, um, and turn off both copies. The um, Wave product only turned turned off the uh, abnormal gene. So what happened in the Roche trial? And I think you know probably everybody's there have been enough uh, public um, announcements about this. The company um, gave a presentation at the research meeting at the end of April. So this was a great big, huge trial of 800 people with three different groups of patients. Some people got a placebo infusion. Um, some people got um, every other month infusions of the drug. Some people got every fourth month infusion of the drug um, by means of a spinal infusion with a spinal tap. And the thought was that the this um, drug would uh, reduce the amount of the abnormal Huntington protein, but it actually reduces the amount, we think, of both the abnormal and the normal uh, gene product. Um, and what happened was um, at an uh, interim analysis um, uh, through the, the um, they have an independent data safety monitoring committee the people on the two-month drug infusion had worse scores um, than the placebo patients at a point where over half of the subjects were over half the way through the trial. So it wasn't like it was just the first 10 subjects did worse. And maybe it was just, you just happened to have the 10 worst subjects. It was more than half of the patients, more than half of the way through the trial. And the measure on which they were worse is a thing that we call the composite unified Huntington's disease rating scale which includes measures of both movement and uh, thinking and also just how patients feel. Um, and uh, so the people getting the higher dose of the drug actually had worse scores than the people getting the placebo. Um, to, their, to their credit, I think the company is gonna continue to follow people in the study, um, uh, just not administer any more placebo or drug 
um, but to con continue to follow those people, because it's really important to know that the people on the higher dose of the drug, um, once you quit giving them the drug, do they get better? Do they continue to get worse or do they stay the same? Um, so, you know, again, we need to learn from our failures. What, what is the trajectory? Um, uh, does this drug have short-term effects? Does it have long-term effects? Um, and so we'll find out. Um, the WAVE trial had almost the opposite problem. So this is a very small, what they call a phase one trial, trying to find the optimal dose of, of two different drugs that they were using. Their drugs were specifically designed to lower just the abnormal Huntington protein. Nothing bad happened, but their problem was it seemed like it wasn't strong enough. They were unable to show that the drug actually changed the level of the Huntington protein. So we kind of got, you know, mama bear and papa bear. The Roche product was too strong and did something bad. The Wave product wasn't strong enough. And so hopefully the next time we'll find something uh, in between. Um, my understanding from both companies is that they do, they do plan to continue in the Huntington's field. They're not quitting. Um, so so what, do, what do you think happened? Well, you can think of at least two or three different things that, that could have been a problem, for instance, with the Roche trial. Um, um, one is that it turns off both copies of the gene, and maybe I don't want my normal copy of the gene turned off. Um, maybe it's the, the way the drug is administered. It's, it's burdensome, uh, obviously, to have a spinal tap every other month. And was that part of the problem? Um, and then the other thing, of course, is that the people who are currently enrolled in these studies are people who are diagnosed as having symptomatic Huntington's disease. Um, they go to their doctor, they have enough symptoms on exam, they have chorea, they have cognitive change, they're not able to work anymore, whatever it might be. Um, they have enough symptoms that the doctor is able to give a clinical diagnosis of Huntington's disease. And of course, we all know that the, that the disease starts long before that. Um, they, they actually have uh, perhaps more data about that in the Parkinson's world. Um, we are actually taught in the Parkinson's world that when the patient walks in the door the very first time with subtle symptoms of Parkinson's, that they've already lost 50 to 75% of the cells in that part of the brain that's, that gets the first hit in Parkinson's. So obviously there's been a lot of disease going on before the patient shows up with symptoms. There's a lot of compensating that your brain is able to do. And maybe what you really wanna do is treat people you know, five years earlier, 10 years earlier. In the Parkinson's clinic, we have the problem that we don't, I can't look around the room and know who's going to get Parkinson's. Um, but again, this is where Huntington's disease is different. We can look around the room, whether we should or not is another question, but we, we do have the ability to figure out ahead of time who is going to get Huntington's disease. Um, everybody who has two normal genes is not going to get Huntington's disease. Everybody who has one abnormal gene will get Huntington's disease. So how, how can we refine this understanding of, of what Huntington's is so it helps us with research studies? First of all, we need to thank those pioneers who participated in these trials. We need to learn from these experiences and then we'll move forward. Um, I do think that the gene genie is out of the bottle. Um, we are not gonna quit doing trials and studies uh, looking at how to impact on the, on the gene. But one of the things that's happening is a change in our view of the course of Huntington's. In 1981, uh, my colleague, Dr. Iris Olson and his colleague, Stan Fahn, came up with a um, rating system for Huntington's disease um, that it started when the doctor made the diagnosis. You had stage one and stage two, stage three, four or five. And this um, I showed in one of the prior uh, presentations. These are the details of the Schulz and Fahn total functional capacity scale. This is very useful to me in the clinic. It really is very practical. It talks about things that people have to do, like working or managing their own activities of daily living, bathing, dressing, doing chores, where they live. Um, and that's sort of, that's all we knew. That's when Huntington's began is when you went to the doctor and got diagnosed. Then along came the ability to do a gene test. And you could do a gene test when you're you know, any age. We sort of like to limit it to adults. So here you get a gene test at age 18, 
Now you know that you have the abnormal gene, but you have, but you're not diagnosable. You are what we would refer to as pre-symptomatic. And then at some point you cross the line and you start having symptoms and you get diagnosed and then you go down the, the staging system of before. But um, thank you, thank you to all the people who participated in studies like Predict HD or Track HD in Europe or Enroll HD. Um, you know, Predict HD, God, that was 2000, that was 20 years ago. So it's probably your parents that were involved in Predict HD and now you're involved in Enroll HD. These studies have followed people annually for years, including people who are not yet diagnosed, people who are at risk, and also people who are not at risk. So we have a comparison group people who have HD, and these have included thousands of clinical office tests, uh, scans, spinal fluid measurements. And from these, we are now, uh, we finally are starting to have enough data. And unfortunately, it takes thousands and thousands of pieces of data to really understand what's normal, what's not normal, which measurements change over time and how much. And that's um, something we refer to as validating a biomarker. So it is, sounds great to say that, you know, my, my spinal fluid Huntington level is five and it's supposed to be zero, but is that clearly abnormal or could that just be a blip in the, you know, because I bumped my head the other day uh, and does it change over time and how much does it change over time? Probably the first biomarkers that will meet the sort of standards necessary to be used in a research study will have to do with um, very careful measurements of brain MRIs. Um, and this is different than how you do a brain MRI in the clinic. In the clinic, you get an MRI, the radiologist looks at the pictures and, and sends a, a report. Um, in the research studies, we do very um, detailed computerized um, uh, uh, measurements of where is the edge of the caudate nucleus, and you try to get a three-dimensional measurement of the actual total volume of these structures in the brain. Um, and so it's, it's really a research MRI is really quite different from a clinical MRI. And then um, we're looking at certain chemicals in the spinal fluid, and it wouldn't surprise me if those are the next biomarkers that, that are able to be validated. So if this, if or as we are able to um, really uh, define these biomarkers, and there's a, there is a large group of researchers actively working on this to kind of cure, um, combine all the data and really hammer out what's what what's normal, what's what's the progression of abnormality. Well, now we're going to have a new um, view of the course of Huntington's disease. So there's going to be a time where you you've got the Huntington gene, but you really, by anything we can look at, any way we know to measure, you're completely normal. So at age six, we really cannot tell a difference between somebody who's got an abnormal Huntington gene with you know 40 repeats and somebody who's got two normal genes. Then there may come a time where some biomarker starts to budge a little bit. So your MRI scan with very careful volumetric measurement of the caudate nucleus has slipped below the, the um, fifth percentile. Um, kind of like when the pediatrician measures a child's height, you know, anything, there, there's a huge range of normal, but when somebody slips above or below the, uh, below the fifth percentile or above the 95th percentile, you say, well, that's, that's starting to worry me a little bit. Let's, let's investigate a little further. So, you know, there may come a time where we've got a biomarker where we say, here's, here's what 5 to 95% looks like, and people who are outside of that, that's not normal. Um, then there may come a time where a person has maybe a biomarker that's abnormal, but also on a, like an office cognitive test, they're, they're not doing quite as well as they should or quite as well as they used to. So kind of a mild clinical finding which they may or may not be aware of, or it may or may not really be affecting anything in their day-to-day -day life. So the, the you know, biomarker abnormality may, may start 10 years before the person is diagnosable. A subtle clinical finding, a little hint of, of funny movement that maybe is normal in a nervous person, that may be a couple of years or a few years before the time the person's overtly diagnosable. <clears throat> 
And then comes a time where there's really a functional change. And that's that's when you leap onto the Schultz and Fahn scale, where you're you're having some kind of a functional change in your, your um, capabilities due to Huntington's disease. And then you kind of go through stage one to five. Who cares about all this? Why is it important? If we can identify a biomarker that reliably distinguishes people who have the abnormal gene from people who don't have the abnormal gene, even before you have functional or clinically diagnosable symptoms, and if that biomarker changes in a reliable way over time, then perhaps that biomarker could be used in a disease modifying trial to evaluate the effects of treatment. All of the people in the current gene directed studies are people diagnosed with HD because as the studies were designed, we said, well, you know, how can you show you're helping somebody who's not sick yet? Um, if you don't even have HD yet, how can I show that I'm helping you? But if I can measure your CSF Huntington level and know that it's below the lower limit of normal. So in this little schematic I drew, um, there, the biomarker is decreasing over time. So there's a time where it's normal and then the arrow starts to angle down. The yellow is kind of that normal range. So even though the biomarker starts to decline, it may still be in the normal range for a little while, but there comes a time where the level or the size or the measurement of the biomarker slips below the normal range. Um, and that may be some time before the person is, is diagnosable with Huntington's disease. If all this works out, it would empower that group of people who are known to be gene positive but not yet symptomatic to potentially participate in clinical trials of drugs to change the course of the disease. And again, I, the analogy I use is it's fine and well to treat breast cancer after it's metastasized, but what you'd really like to do is treat breast cancer when the only way to tell you've got it is by doing a fancy test like a mammogram and see a little tiny pea-sized Thing that you're not even sure if it's normal or not, um, you really would like to diagnose um, cancer based on that, essentially a biomarker, the, the ultrasound, the, the mammogram finding um, of the cancer. So we're hoping um, that, that we can now start to redefine um, the course of Huntington's disease to include this time prior to diagnosis and then empower people during that time potentially to be involved in research studies. None of this is here today right now, but this is, um, as uh, Deb mentioned in the introduction, these are our hopes for the future. Um, and I wanna hurry, hasten to say, we are not talking about replacing the clinical diagnosis of HD by a physician with some kind of MRI scan done in the clinic 10 years before you have any symptoms. We're not talking about um, you know, diagnosing HD before it's even having any impact. If there is a disease modifying treatment that helps at that stage, then just like there's a reason to do a mammogram because the survival rates are better if you treat breast cancer when it's a little tiny pea-sized thing you can only see on a mammogram. But if you didn't have a treatment for breast cancer, there's not really a reason to, to detect it when it's a pea-sized uh, uh, tiny thing. So we're not talking about, this is not something we're talking about doing in the clinic tomorrow. There's not a clinical trial currently that involves pre-symptomatic people in a, in a disease modifying therapy. In today's clinic, the neurologic exam, formal cognitive testing remain the best tools to tell if you have enough findings to warrant the diagnosis of Huntington's disease. And again, just to point out an, another thing that, that you know, the, the diagnosis of Huntington's disease, for instance, does not immediately um, cause you to uh, have, be disabled or to have to be a candidate for disability um, uh, benefits. You still have to wait until the HD has some impact on your clinical function, on your functional abilities before you, for instance, get on something like disability. So I'm not talking about changing how we um, uh, treat or diagnose Huntington's disease in the clinic. I'm sharing our hopes and dreams for research, um, hopefully in the near future. So that's it for that topic. I wanna just um, spend um, a minute um, on um, juvenile HD, and then I will um, 
give a, a kind of a call to action. So another um, project that is um, happening um, that people should be aware of um, is a project called Join HD. Um, this is being um, sort of sponsored um, by the Huntington's Disease Youth Organization or HDO. Um, I, I think um, we have all, uh, well, I've struggled over the years and I know my parents of kids with juvenile HD have struggled, feel like they're sort of alone even within the larger HD community. And gee, isn't it nice you're doing all these trials in adults? When are you ever going to do a study in kids? One of the problems with doing um, studies, say for instance, of a disease modifying therapy, one of these gene silencing therapies, one of the problems with doing that in kids is you need to have a certain number of kids to actually do a scientific research study. Um, studies tend to be done in a place by a research team, um, particularly when it's a treatment that, that, for instance, requires spinal infusions or surgeries or it's such a novel treatment that you really aren't sure whether you're gonna um, help somebody or cause, cause some kind of injury. There have been some gene therapy trials that have had notable um, uh, calamities. Um, and so you really wanna be careful about how you do a, a study in, uh, in children for the first time. Um, we don't even know where all the kids with Huntington's disease are. So the Juvenile Onset Initiative for Huntington's Disease, or JOIN HD, um, the, the first pass of that project is quite literally, I call it stand up and be counted. Um, so raise your hand and say, I have juvenile Huntington's disease and I live in you know, Little Rock, Arkansas. Um, there'll hopefully once we have people identify themselves, there'll be part two, part three to that study. Um, where people can, um, you know, perhaps fill out more detailed medical information or agree to be contacted to participate in, in other research studies. Um, but if you have a uh, juvenile HD, if you know somebody with juvenile HD, I really urge you to um, go to the HDO website. The, there's a thing about Join HD on the HDO website and um, stand up and be counted. Um, so that's that. Um, my call to action is related to this. It's really an, uh, it's, it's a call to action and an ode to Ellie, who's a dear beloved patient of mine who, who um, died recently. Um, Ellie was born to a single mom um, who later married a wonderful man and had two more wonderful kids. Um, Ellie was always a little bit slow, needed extra help in school, but by about age 12, she really kind of started to decline, started to fall behind. And um, and at that point was diagnosed with juvenile onset Huntington's disease. This does not sound like a recipe for success, um, but after Ellie was diagnosed with um, juvenile onset HD, she organized a kickball tournament to raise money and awareness for Huntington's disease. She traveled 330 miles each way, um, probably uphill in the snow, uh, given the part of the country we're in, um, to participate in a study about juvenile onset HD in Iowa until she got too old to participate. You know, she got to be 20 years old and they said, well, this is for teenagers, you're too old. Um, so she grandmothered out of this study on juvenile HD in Iowa. She gave a speech um, at the Huntington Study Group um, Family Day Symposium about participating in research when the meeting was in Minnesota a few years ago. Uh, when Nature Magazine wanted to do a, a special issue about Huntington's disease and wanted to talk to somebody with juvenile HD, she, they interviewed Ellie and her picture was in Nature Magazine. Uh, you should know that um, from the doctor point of view, research point of view, Nature Magazine is the most prestigious medical research journal in, well, the world. And Ellie's picture was there. She was featured in a video on the Huntington's uh, Youth Organization website about juvenile onset HD, which I kid you not, has received 1.8 million hits. Now, even if 500,000 of those hits came from her little brother. <laughs> you know, that still has a million hits on this website. Um, people who've, who've learned a little bit about Huntington's disease um, from Ellie. And she, she died um, a few weeks ago, sadly, and donated her brain to research. So, um, 
um, weep not for Ellie. Um, she lived a wonderful life in her 24 years. This is actually taken from the uh, HDO uh, uh, website where they describe the, the, uh, the uh, registry study, the HD join study. Um, so that's Ellie a few years ago. Um, so, you know, weep not for Ellie. Um, Ellie did more in her 24 years than most of us do in a much longer lifetime. Um, this is my call to action. Um, research needs you. And unless you're really happy with the treatments we have today, you need research. So let's work on this together um, and let's all do what we can to make life better for people with Huntington's disease and their families, both for today, but even more for tomorrow. Um, and I'll stop there and take questions. One question I see is, um, how do early cognitive and behavioral changes impact your new diagnostic scale? Um, uh, um, so this will be used in, in research. I think we struggle with, we've always struggled with people who have no motor signs, no uh, uh, cognitive signs, but just have behavioral problems. They have depression or, or behavioral issues, um, uh, especially in the juvenile HD group, honestly, when, you know, because, um, gee, my 12-year-old is misbehaving. I think he must have Huntington's disease. Um, uh, and I know from experience that 12-year-olds who don't have Huntington's disease sometimes misbehave. Um, so, um, I think we're going to be more reliant as they become, as we become more refined in our understanding in um, in the sort of hard uh, uh, biochemical or imaging markers. Um, behavior can come and go, remembering things can come and go, but your your MRI measurement of your clot A volume isn't going to change depending on whether you're in a good mood today or not, or whether you had a good night's sleep. Um, how you behave may change or how you function on a cognitive test may change depending on whether you had a cup of coffee today or got a good night's sleep last night. Um, so, um, and we will be very careful about how we set up this research scale, if you want to call it that. Um, uh, another question, how some of the medications prescribed in the past changed over the last 20 years and this is where I may um, talk about, uh, you know, off-label use um, of a drug. Um, actually, I struggle with the idea of off-label use. Um, if I use a drug that's approved to treat depression and I give it to somebody with Huntington's disease, is that really an off-label use of the drug just because it's not proven to be beneficial for depression in Huntington's disease? I don't think of that as an off-label use. I'm using an antidepressant for somebody who's got depression. And what's happened over the last 20 years is there's been an explosion of um, uh, medications to treat depression, anxiety, irritability, impulsiveness, um, uh, and, and uh, a whole new set of what they call the uh, atypical antipsychotic drugs, the olanzapine and risperidone and uh, aripiprazole and, and there's several others, rather than the old drugs, Haldol, Thorazine, um, Melaril. Um, so, um, so we are, a lot of us are using some of these newer drugs. Um, why not uh, in the treatment of people with uh, symptoms in Huntington's disease um, and new antidepressants, the whole category of the um, SSRI antidepressants is probably in the last 25 years. Um, the the um, sertraline and fluoxetine and that whole group of drugs. Um, uh, so it, it's, so we've just sort of flowed with the times, I think, in terms of using um, medications for behavioral and mood symptoms. Um, obviously, tetrabenazine came to market in about 2000 and, let me guess, uh, nine, um, something like that. Um, and so prescribe having anything that's actually FDA approved to treat symptoms in Huntington's is new with the uh, advent of tetrabenazine and then deuterated tetrabenazine. Um, 
And again, another question, how will this new scale change when a person is diagnosed? Again, um, I was um, hesitant to describe this scale and make it sound like it actually exists. It doesn't really exist yet. This was in a talk about our plans and hopes and ideas. There's a um, large committee of people working hard on this. And I talked to Sarah Tabrizi, who's uh, one of the leaders in HD, both clinical and lab research from London. Um, and she must have said 20 times in our conversation, this is not replacing the clinical evaluation of patients. This is not replacing a clinical um, scale, but, but the hope is to kind of uh, uh, empower or incorporate into research more effectively people who are in that pre-diagnosable stage. A uh, question about recommendations for sleep in Huntington's disease. Um, I, I really am going to stop short of recommending any particular drug. Um, in fact, one of the things I feel that we have to guard against in the Huntington's clinic is assuming that everything that happens is due to HD. Um, people with HD can also have sleep apnea. People with Huntington's disease can have restless leg syndrome. And so depending on what the situation is, um, just because you have Huntington's disease doesn't mean that you shouldn't have your sleep study evaluated fully by a sleep specialist. Um, uh, there are any number of ways, that being said, there are any number of ways that Huntington's disease can affect sleep. People who are depressed have lousy sleep. People who are anxious have lousy sleep. People who perseverate, who get obsessed, uh, stuck on an idea and just keeps banging around in their head, those people may have trouble getting to sleep. And then you would treat the depression, the anxiety, the obsessive compulsive issues. Um, uh, and so sort of understanding the, and some people are just in a lousy, uh, you know, if you have two-year-olds, you probably don't sleep well, but you probably don't want a sleeping pill if you have a two-year-old because you need to be able to wake up. Um, so I, again, it's, it's, I'm not going to give a specific um, treatment recommendation, um, but uh, but talk to your doctor and, and, and keep in mind that not necessarily is your sleep trouble um, due to Huntington's disease. Um, another question, uh, is there any upcoming drug or trial that I personally feel is more promising than all the others, or are they roughly equal? Um, uh, you know, I think we were all, um, I think because the the uh, studies by Roche sort of had the, the they, they got there first. Everybody had great hopes for the, for the Roche trial. Um, uh, I, I really think we just have to learn from these two studies. I also thought WAVE was a wonderful idea, a much better idea to turn off just the gene you want to turn off and not the other copy of the gene. That sounded kind of cool too. Um, and maybe, as I said, the delivery system is a problem. So, so um, doing the surgical injection directly into the brain, although it's kind of a, a tedious, uh, scary thing to do, at least you're done. With, you, know, you don't have to keep coming back for further treatments. Um, I think some of the um, RNA modifying treatments, the Novartis and, and uh, PTC therapeutics, some of those might be pills. Wouldn't it be wonderful to take a pill that would actually help your disease rather than surgeries and, and injections? Um, but, you know, we just, this is so new and so novel that I think we, we really don't know which way is going to work best. Um, we try to guess based on mouse studies. <clears throat> One of the problems of Sorry, one of the problems we have with mouse studies is that the mouse brain is simply much smaller than the human brain. So if you want to bathe the brain with your chemical or drug or ASO or whatever it might be, or inject it, um, you know, somewhere in the brain and hope that it'll, it'll sort of diffuse, kind of like when you put a, a sponge in water, um, you know, the the the, the water first touches the sponge at one point, but then the water get, kind of gets absorbed by the sponge and you come back 10 minutes later and the whole sponge is wet. 
Um, well, if you inject your thing, uh, you know, around the surface of the brain, you'd really like to get to cells that are, you know, one inch deeper in the brain. Well, one inch deep in a mouse brain, you're out the other side. <laughs> one inch deep in the human brain, and you know, you may not even have gotten to the structure of interest. So, so I, I think we will learn a lot about about how we deliver these treatments to the cells of interest. Um, um, but you got to deliver it in a way that it actually gets to the brain cells. So. Um, so I, I'm going to not, um, I'm not going to pin my hopes on one particular uh, drug or trial. Other questions? We have silence here. I'm sorry about the uh, leaf blowers outside. If people are <laughs> hearing noise outside. So. Well, we're waiting for a, uh, a last question or two to come in. I do want to remind folks that, as uh, Dr. Nance mentioned earlier, your participation in clinical trials is critical to finding the answers to Huntington's disease. So, you know, when you, a great place to find clinical trials going on in your area is by using the HD Trial Finder, which you can find either on the HDSA website or going to trialfinder.org. You can just sign up with your email address and zip code, and when the clinical trial uh, comes around to your area or there's a sponsor who's looking for potential candidates uh, to join a new clinical trial, you will be contacted uh, by them to see if you fit whatever their criteria may be. So it's a great way for you to give back um, and to recognize the early pioneers who have made clinical trials possible. So I, I don't see anything else coming in. We are just about a ton, out of time. I want to thank Dr. Martha Nance from the HCSA Center of Excellence at Hennepin Healthcare for this really wonderful three-part series that we initiated last month. I hope you all enjoyed it. Um, they are, all of the presentations are available on HCSA's YouTube channel. So I invite you to go into view uh, HD 101 and HD 202 if you did not have an opportunity to join us uh, for the live presentation. And HTSA and me, will, and me will be taking a short break for the summer. We'll be back in September with a new round of speakers. And we hope you'll join us then. Dr. Nance, thank you very much for your time and for the wonderful presentation. Everyone have a great day. Thank you.